Welcome to Face to Face, and today we're going to talk about politics, we're going to talk about uh, international security, we're going to talk about Assange. Uh, I'm with Diane Saar and who is running for US Senate in 2024. Diane, welcome to Face to Face. Thank you very much. How are you doing? I'm I'm well, and I'm very glad to be here. And uh, we seem to be meeting rather. Yeah, frequently. exactly. We meet, meet time <laughs> and time again. So, uh, where did we, we met for the Ukraine in uh, People Forum in New York, in uh, New York City, and then we met again uh, yesterday uh, for Assange. It was a great rally. Yes. Do you have anything yeah. to say about Assange and? Um, well, I I would say I was really happy to see that there were a lot of people there, yeah. uh, a lot of prominent people, not only Roger Waters, whom everybody knows, no. but <laughs> yeah, Joe Loria and Randy Credico and Max Blumenthal and the woman from the Parliament of Germany. Germany was, was great. Yeah, yeah, she was. Yeah. Great. yeah, yeah. So it shows it's really a global battle, and I think it also puts the lie to this planned summit of democracy that Joe Biden wants to host in March. I mean, what a terrible fraud for that to be occurring in the United States, which is trying to criminally prosecute Julian Assange. Oh, it's not the first time he does it. I think that's the second. That's right. a, he already did one after uh, uh, putting a coup in Bolivia. And uh, yeah, I mean, we love to, uh, we love our democracy. <laughs> <laughs> Right. All the democracy that money can buy. Exactly. At, you know, 8 billion in, in Ukraine and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, you run for, you already ran, no? Uh, like a couple of, of months ago, not even. Right. November, uh, where we have a story there. And then you also plan to uh, run again on 2024. Right. Right. And I'll just say I'm running as an independent. <clears throat> and again, this shows the lie of the fraud. In New York, you cannot just be an independent. You have to create a party name. So I said LaRouche because I worked with him for 33 years. And frankly, his case was a precedent for Assange and all of these witch hunts because he was a presidential candidate who was framed up on conspiracy charges and sentenced to five, well, 15 years in prison of which he served five because he, uh, I would say he was a co-thinker of Franklin Roosevelt who really thought after World War II, the British, the French, the Dutch should give up their colonies. The purpose of the Bretton Woods Conference and the International Monetary Fund and World Bank, the intended purpose was that after World War II, every nation should have its independence and economic sovereignty. And FDR kept saying over and over again that the cause of war is poverty. If you have nations that are looting other nations, you're never going to have peace. And of course, the end of the war was conveniently delayed until after he died. So we had Truman, who was willing to drop nuclear bombs on Japan, which were completely unnecessary. And I think this two of them, two of them, two exactly, and and and, and really, uh, I mean that's what I put on my book about uh, the White West. Uh, I mean the first one it was not enough. Like we, we we could not already learn what we had to learn about, and then so we had the second one. Um, yeah, so sorry. Yeah, no, it's because what was the point? I mean, look, MacArthur had done a tremendously successful naval blockade and the emperor of Japan was already negotiating the terms of surrender with the Vatican. Yeah. So this wasn't even, had no military purpose. The purpose was what Bertrand Russell, who somehow gets known as a peace activist, but said, and by the way, I don't know if you know, he said we should preemptively nuke the Soviet Union so they didn't develop nuclear weapons, but to create a, a kind of a one world government, to create a, a domain of terror so that you could use this to get nations to fall into line. And it certainly was a horror. It was horrific. And we have a situation now, which I think Scott Ritter described accurately, the nuclear doctrine of the U.S. is sort of nuclear blackmail because we're trying to play coy and say, well, we don't really know um, exactly what conditions would lead us to 
a first nuclear strike, but we are saying that we have the right to launch a first strike or a preemptive strike. That's very dangerous, and it puts the world in a really precarious position. Well, I think that's what Russian uh, is pushing the the limit there to try to show the the, the and and be able to express uh, the discrepancy between the dialogue and 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 the reality on the ground. And I think uh, that start to get a um, little bit uh, more international news and and people all over the world besides the Europe and the US are really taking a stand more in favor of of uh, of Russia than than in support of the US and, and uh, I'm yeah. so glad you said that because Americans I'm afraid have no idea they just don't know you know the world is looking at we're like the emperor with no clothes the whole world can see how ridiculous and hypocritical we are and it's not a secret but we seem to think that everything that we do or the way we do it in the United States is the best. It's just not true. And I say that as a patriot who loves my country deeply. That's why I'm running. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, that's not the discussion. There. The discussion is we need to be able to learn to listen and to and to understand the point of view of, of other country. The, I mean, I just put, did an article about the, the multipolar uh, situation of the world today. It's no way we could keep having this mentality of we control everything and then we're gonna we're gonna dictate what the people have to do and how they have to do it it's not that's not happening anymore sure well look at the united states i think it was the i forget if it was the foreign minister but a couple of years ago i think it was the representative from pakistan who came to the u.n general assembly and he said you know, the U.S. might consider uh, redirecting some of its defense budget to fixing the potholes in New York City. <laughs> I mean, anyone who comes here can see it. New York City smells bad. There are rats running over your feet. There's potholes. We don't have care for the mentally ill. We don't have housing for poor people, working poor people. Uh, these things are not secrets. And I think most Americans actually really want that the government would address these matters and would do something about it. Uh, they would infinitely prefer that over sending billions of dollars worth of weapons to a totalitarian, corrupt, pro-Nazi regime in Kiev, for example. Yeah, but the discussion was never open. Beside uh, a block out uh, politically from both parties to really, uh, 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 you know, send 80 billion and then we keep doing the the, the the sending of money and weapons but the the real discussion never happened really about the, the the engagement of the us and how people will react to it so the 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 problem now it's between the the political level and and the, the people is such a gap then it's very complicated to call it democracy because 50 percent of people are not even voting and they are not even knowing what's going on so i mean it's it's getting very complicated to <laughs> right but i think that's where you get a revolution you know i think it was i don't know if it was lance burgess or who said at the time the berlin wall came down and the soviet union disintegrated and somebody said when when you get to the point where everybody knows the news media is lying that everything that's the official narrative is not true, that this is kind of a revolutionary moment because the powers that be are no longer the powers that be. They, they cannot force, they can't impose themselves on people anymore. And I think that's where we are. Great. I mean, I totally, I'm very optimistic. I'm like, this is, a, this is our moment because we, that's the moment we are wishing for, for 40 or 30 years, I mean, from, from, uh, because it's really collapsing. It's really, I mean, the UK, it's getting down the drain. Like, like, I mean, they don't even know how they're going to be able to, to put, to, to eat the house in, in the winter. I mean, it's going to be very complicated. And I think the consequences. So, so we, this is true. We need to have this discussion and, and we need to have it uh, very strong and, and very clear. I agree. Yeah. I mean, that's why, just to say that LaRouche's widow put out this document about 10 principles, which is not a mandate, 
but to say, look, there are certain things that uh, have to be the basis for a new relationship among nations. One, that the sovereignty of every nation must be respected, and that includes the security concerns of each nation, like the principles of peaceful coexistence uh, from the UN Charter or Bandung, non-interference, non-intervention. You don't go around overthrowing other people's governments or telling them what religion to have. Uh, but then closely thereafter, she says the second principle is poverty alleviation, yeah. that every nation, we should there should be no more poor people on the planet. We have the technology. We can green the deserts. We can bring electricity and clean water to people. This could be done if we wanted to, and it should be done. And of course, doing that would change the whole culture. People China would... develop China develop a, a stand on, on human rights and on that line of, of it's not a personal story. It's a social equality for people to have access to health, to education as a social. And, 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 and I mean, that was very interesting. Sorry. Right. No, that's totally right. That's totally right. And uh, she talks exactly healthcare, life expectancy. We should try to prolong instead of being like, you know, the Malthusians who want everyone to drop dead as quickly as possible. We should actually try and figure out how to extend people's life, which will involve modern health care, but also decent nutrition, high standard of living, lack of stress. People can think of all the things that cause the deaths of despair, whether it's drug addiction, suicide, overdose, alcoholism. Uh, so a, a total change, a commitment. And that's a change of principle. There's no specific policy that she's dictating here because every nation will find their own way to do it, but they have to have the freedom to be allowed to do that. And that has to be the discussion among uh, sovereign states. Yeah. You mentioned 10, no? So you don't want yeah, to- Yeah, well, we're only a few up, but uh, we talked about not having blocks, she said, which I think is really tricky because now you have the global south or you have the BRICS, you have the SCO, the G20, uh, which includes the G7 who seem to, you know, there seems to be a divide or people say blocks. And her point is you can't have blocks because then you'll end up back in geopolitics. So while it's totally understandable that people don't want to use the dollar anymore and they don't want to be under this Anglo-American so-called rules-based order where we make the rules and they're totally arbitrary, you are going to have to recruit the West to change the way it thinks. Um, we've got to have certain things that are a common mission for mankind, like health care, like um, eradication of poverty and, and, and getting rid of nuclear weapons. And I would add biological and chemical weapons. I think we have a really a great danger and we don't even know to what extent because this has been so covered up. But I think we should get rid of anything that can destroy the entire human race. We should figure out a verifiable way of uh, getting rid of it. Now concerning your uh, your election, um, how, how, do, how do you see it? How do you uh, plan to develop the, the, the campaign? Well, this is one of these funny things like putting sanctions on Russia, which backfire terribly because in the state of New York, an independent candidate has to get triple the signatures of anyone else. What happened to me in the last election is I collected 66,000 signatures in six weeks, which forced oh, wow. me. Yeah, and it forced me to build a huge grassroots statewide organization. So happily, that still exists. And the reason I wanted to launch my new campaign right away is because I don't want to lose. We have very good people who really worked very hard, who are very uh -huh. committed uh -huh. to um, peace and economic development. So I want to keep this process in motion. I'm actually planning a major conference in New York City, January 8th, to discuss policy. What should be the policy of the U.S. Senate? What should be the policy of the United States with regard to the rest of the world um, as a way of launching this campaign, which I see as being a platform and a vector to bring in ideas that otherwise would be silenced? 
you know, I was excluded from the one senator, senatorial debate in the last election, which was outrageous since they said, you have to prove you're a serious candidate, so you have to get 45,000 signatures that will demonstrate that you're serious. So, okay, I got 66,000 signatures. I, I crossed their arbitrary, outrageous threshold. And then they said, well, you can't be in the debate because you can only be in the debate if you can demonstrate you have 15% of the vote in the polls. And I said, well... It's impossible. I mean, no one get 15% in a... In a not even Biden no. can get 15% in, in well, it was, poll, so. No, and the polls didn't allow people to... See, I got very suspicious because yeah. I, since I had so many volunteers. When they yeah. started doing the polls, they called. They said, hey, Diana, we just got a call from this poll. And when we told them... We were voting for Diane Sayre. They said, oh, no, that's not an option. You can't pick Diane <laughs> Sayre. So I was supposed to get 15% in a poll that doesn't allow people to choose me as a candidate. And that was the basis for excluding me. Yeah. That's how the, our democracy works most of the time. Well, right. <laughs> that's yeah. why I'll be, I'm going to be a featured speaker at the Democracy Summit in Washington, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure you do. Yeah, yeah. You have already your, <laughs> I'm sure you have your tickets. In, it's, on, it's in the mail. Your, your flag right, is yeah. in the mail. Right. It's coming. Right. Uh, do you want to talk briefly about the, the number story about the last election? The surprising... Sure. Just since we're on the subject of democracy, um, a very interesting thing happened. There was one poll in the state that did allow people to select me. And according to that poll, I should have had about 5% of the vote, which was much higher than I had, except in, in a couple of counties. Yeah. yeah. Um, but what happened is election night, I was watching the votes come in and it was slowly approaching. I thought, well, they wouldn't say I got less than 66,000 because that's how many signatures I got. Uh, so it went up to 55,000. And then I got an email actually from a friend uh, well, about two o'clock in the morning where it was eight o'clock in France. And he said, um, something really weird is happening with Diane Sayre's vote. It's going down. <laughs> um, I didn't expect that. So I don't have a screenshot of the 55,000, although someone else does. So starting with 53,000 and then in, a, in a East Coast time, by the next morning, my total number of votes was down to 29,000. So that once you got over 90 95 or 89 percent of the vote counted the more votes that came in the fewer votes i had yeah so and, they, and this was... they vote against you so they, it was a, a menu's vote it was not uh, voting for somebody right. it was voting against someone right i had negative votes i had exactly. negative votes somehow <laughs> coming in um and uh, by Friday, it was down to 25,000. So I lost more than 50% of my vote. I lost 30,000 votes in, in, <laughs> over in, three days over in three public. Days. Yeah, in the yeah, public. Yeah, I, saw, I saw the screenshot. And um, yeah. I think we still have to figure out this one because he opened so many questions. And, and <laughs> then we need to, to, to look at it. And I know you are working on this story. So, um, any anything you want to plug before we um, we, we leave it here? Uh, besides well, Gen January eighth. Uh, yeah, January eighth in New York, and you can visit my website sareforsenate.com, s a r e for senate.com to to RSVP and get the details. That's it. Uh, that's the uh, website. Uh, I would encourage people to think bold, and I appreciate that you say you're optimistic. Me too. The, the world is moving into a totally new paradigm, and that's why these evil people are so desperate. Yeah. The thing that makes it dangerous is they're not rational and they're not moral. Is that crazy? Uh, <laughs> so that puts us in danger because they don't seem to really care if 100,000 Ukrainians are dead or a yeah. million other people are... You know, Madeleine Albright said half a million Iraqi children. Oh, well, it's a price we're prepared to pay. So that makes it very dangerous. But uh, this system is not the the Anglo-Dutch liberal financial system is finished. And that's why it's so urgent that Americans and people in Western Europe actually think big and bold, like the founders of the United States, the people who were against the British Empire, 
about how we can do good, how we can do good in the planet, how we can do good for mankind and good for our nation. And um, never set your sights lower than that. That's really what I would like to tell people. Thank you so much. Uh, it was really a pleasure. Keep uh, me and, and everybody else up to date about your, your campaign and your position and so on and so forth. Uh, if anything we can do to help, um, you know, present size here to, uh, for that. And um, hope to, to talk to you very soon. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. And I'll probably see you somewhere. <laughs> exactly. I'm sure. <laughs> that was your show face to face. And keep watching your news on presenza.com. And we hope to hear from you very soon. Thank you.